Nooner with Dooner. Welcome to Wednesday, everybody. A lot of stories today. A lot of things to wake up to. Really interesting news about Convoy being sold. We're going to get into that Rachel Premack in a little bit. But I have something new to show. Well, it's not something new. I want to combine two things. Something we've talked about a lot, which is the massive influx of truck capacity. We've also been talking about the brokerage winter. And no better graphs show that off than this. Luke Velasca, he tweeted this. He said, still too much trucking capacity. Truckload volumes, which are the green line you see on there, are 16% higher now. Versus this time in 2018, trucking authorities, which are the white line, are 47% higher now versus 2018. Transportation service providers are forced into a waiting game of survival until this ends. That, and we've talked about this in trucking, the bloodbath. we got to get rid of where well, there's too many trucking companies, too many came in, a lot have to bleed off. But what about the brokers? We've been talking about this brokerage winter now and the struggles that they're facing. And I have even more data from Kevin Hill at Brush Pass Research. He says, well, year over year growth of new freight brokerage is down 5.6%. There is more to the story, notably the explosive growth during the pandemic. And it was explosive. 10,006 new freight brokers were created from January January 2020 to the peak in November of 2023. This is an astronomical, it's not even November yet, Kevin, maybe you meant 22. This is an astronomical 47% increase in three short years. The trend of freight brokerage closing shop now is real and will likely intensify over the coming months. It will be interesting to see if it bottoms near pandemic levels or if most of the new brokers stick around for the long haul. Really great data from Kevin Hill. Really interesting to see that trend go down. And, you know, you guys might like to hear it, too. We've talked so much about those truckers. But what does this all mean? This is all killing the market. We're looking at truckload spot rates. Luke Flaska has even more data. He said truckload spot rates are flat, but wait, they are down. Truckload spot rates are flat from the end of August. But if we take out fuel costs, they are down 5.5%. With fuel rising and all-in spot rates being flat, it's really declined in real dollars to the drivers. Tough tough market out there and it's tough on all sides so all you drivers for beating down the brokers just keep in mind a lot of them are on notice too and it's not just the digital freight brokers it's a lot of traditional brokers as well because of this tough environment that we're in so saying a prayer for all of you let's make it through this thing i want to see y'all in 2024 on today's episode of the show though i'm talking to hey a little cowbell a little gong rachel premax she's newly married she was away for like three weeks she uh Good thing nothing happened while she was away. There was no news. I imagine if I was her, there was probably so much anxiety. You know, you want to enjoy your honeymoon. You want to enjoy your wedding. But you're like, but but Convoy, I need to write modes about Convoy. And she couldn't do it. Um, but she gets a chance to today. I'm sure she's just dying. Carriers all, are all, carriers all over are complaining about the rapidly escalating cost of insurance. Reliance Partners, Andrew Hahn is here. He's going to talk about what is driving this cost increase, how to increase and mitigate. I mean, sorry, not increase. You want to mitigate your exposure and then switch providers. I know a lot of you have been asking me to cover this, so I'm happy to have Reliance Partners on to get you some details on that. we got Freightways Alan Adler. He's got the story on Nicola. They're clawing back $165 million from their uh, allegedly, or has he been convicted? I think he's been convicted. So convicted from fraudulent founder Trevor Milton. They want that money back. Plus, we're going to find out what's next for Hylion now that they don't seem to be making trucks anymore. And we're going to find out why Battery Maker Proterra failed. And then we have Justin Martin on. He's going to bring a trucker's perspective on this heist of two million dimes. Um, There was a vodka and Red Bull train heist over here in Tennessee. I don't know if they're getting ready for F3. No, I'm just kidding. That's not how we get our hooch. RVs and trucks parking spots. That caused a big controversy on X yesterday. A cruise shut down in California. And we got a lot more, so we'll tip the band, and then we'll get on into it. Looking for a new adventure? Take the next step on your career journey with AIT Worldwide Logistics. When you join their growing team, you'll collaborate with expert colleagues around the world to create innovative solutions backed by world-class customer service. If you're ready to push the supply chain envelope, your next adventure is waiting. Visit the career section at AITWorldwide.com to learn more and apply today. And it's great they're hiring because, man, I see so many of you on LinkedIn. You got that new job notification. Unfortunately, the market came and bit me in the ass. AIT, they got a job for you. Now it's Rachel Premack. The newly married editorial director at Freightwaves. Hi, Rachel, how are you? Hi. You look, you, you have a different glow to you now. Do you feel different now that <laughs> you've, uh, you've said your vows? Yeah, maybe it could just be the, the fall lighting in my home studio, a.k.a. my second bedroom in my apartment. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was, it was a good wedding, good honeymoon, ready to be back, talk about convoy. <laughs> 
Now, I heard you uh, included trucking in your vows. Our uh, wedding, our freight wedding beat reporter, Craig Fuller, who also happens to be our founder and CEO. Maybe he'll open a wedding. Do you think he'll open a bridal magazine? He's buying like every like media magazine brand out there. But he said that he reported on your wedding and he said that you had uh, trucking in your vows. Yeah, it was it was kind of a joke. Um, So my husband, Alan, is very into sports and politics, and I am not into either of those topics, essentially. So I kind of made a joke about like, oh, you know, we always have so much to talk about, even though I don't have your interest in like arcane sports and politics data and you don't want to spend all day talking about trucking or, you know, South Korea. So that was kind of kind of the joke there. But it was funny because when I wrote it down, I just had Korea. I didn't have trucking, but I felt like I had to had to throw trucking in there. So were you able to in, enjoy the honeymoon and everything, even though I, you know, I asked Craig this when he was on here the other day. I said, what's the bigger story of the year? Is it yellow or is it convoy? And he said, well, in terms of traffic, it's convoy. Hmm. I mean, I feel like I feel like with Convoy, I I wasn't following it as closely like until well, I haven't written any story about it as of today. But I would say that I was able to enjoy it just because the Convoy closure news didn't hit until last Thursday. Um, And that was kind of towards the tail end of my of my trip. Um, I mean, if there is stuff going on with, I mean, everything with yellow has already happened. So if there is things going on with yellow, I may have been a little bit more stressed because I had been covering that a little bit more closely. Overall, I would say I was able to enjoy. Um, it seems like, you know, there's definitely, there's always like something brewing in, in the trucking industry. So regardless, I would have had to miss out on something, unfortunately. But now I'm refreshed Sort where? of, even though there's like a six hour time difference. So I'm like, yeah, where was the honeymoon? Like, where did you go? Where was, where were six hours away? We went to Hawaii. Oh, nice. Did you hang out yeah. with uh, Nick Torres and visit Maui? No, we didn't go to Maui. Um, we were supposed to go to Maui, but then plans changed after the fire. So we went to the big island for one week and then we went to Kauai for, for one week. Well, interesting. Well, your husband may have bought a ring, but someone may be putting a ring on Convoy. There is a new story. The Seattle Times broke it, but it was on, it's on Freight Waves this morning. And it's Freight Waves reported last week that at least two incumbent logistics, we already knew this was happening. They were shopping the tech. This isn't new. But what is new is that apparently a confidential deal is eminent. Dan Lewis, he even said on LinkedIn, people have asked me if we want to share more about what happened. Uh, he might be subtweeting me because I definitely DM'd a few times about this. People have asked me if I'm going to share more about what happened and what we learned all in good time right now i'm heads down working on a deal that would include some of the convoy team and the tech services and it sounds like that's happened do we you don't have any details on the buy he wouldn't tell me do you know i don't have any further details other than you know it seems like it makes sense for convoy to spin out you know the driver facing side of their of their app obviously that had lots of users uh pretty popular pretty well liked among its users so it makes sense that someone should buy that brand because it's been around since 2015 um has a lot of cachet in the driver community it would it would be a shame if that just you know all evaporated um so no i don't i unfortunately don't have any further details or or uh insight onto that other than it's a sale that makes sense considering it's you know, a pretty long stand, long standing, relatively long standing brand in the in the digital freight broker space. It is, and it's funny. You bring up an interesting point that it's a, it's a well known brand. So when we cover it, like on the freight wave side, we can just use the name Convoy. But I noticed, like when the mainstream media has covered it, they're like they don't even say Convoy. They say they say company, like freight company that Bono, the Edge, Bill Gates, and Jeff Bezos invested into. Which yeah. is interesting. I didn't know the Edge also invested in this. Bono, like they must have had to make that money back in the sphere, the Las Vegas sphere. Yeah, the Bono, I, I think I knew but then forgot about the Bono connection. He just doesn't really ever come to mind when I'm like doing anything related to, to my job reporting on the trucking industry. But I'm glad that Bono ma- found his way in here. A GPS where the streets have no name would be awful, Rachel. 
Let's talk about this. So Craig says the epitaph on Convoy, and it's not an epitaph. If they're sold, it's not really an epitaph, is it? It's, it's a, like a renewal, like a phoenix from their ashes, but what caused them to flame up the first time, Craig said it was death by overfunding and blitz scaling. Now, we saw these sky-high valuations that came out during 2020, 2021, even 2022. The, that may have been the, the rope around Convoy's neck was that final round that put them at 3.8 valuation, 3.8 billion. You've done a lot more research on this since we last had that conversation. What have you found out since then? Yeah, so it's interesting because when you look at the, you know, reporting from the information, for example, on what former uh, employees at Convoy say, they say, oh, well, you know, we struggled because uh, our founders didn't have enough logistics experience or it wasn't clear whether we were a tech company or a logistics company. And I was I was speaking to one source for the story uh, that's coming out tomorrow morning. And his point was that, you know, a lot of really successful startups are founded by people who aren't necessarily experts in their field. I mean, when Jeff Bezos founded Amazon, it's not like he was an e-commerce expert. Um, There's, you know, obviously lots of other examples like this. So you can have a startup that's not necessarily founded by absolute experts that doesn't does it thrive in fact in, in a lot of ways you do kind of need that like new perspective in order to have a company shine so i think certainly uh craig's craig's viewpoint on this is that that it was overfunded that they got way too much money too quickly i think that's certainly a, a really compelling reason for why convoy struggled um it's, it's just the whole idea of blitz scaling i think is really starting to fall fall off, uh, especially when you think about uh, companies like Uber or WeWork that got a lot of money really quickly, but ultimately weren't really able to prove themselves as being, you know, a tech company that deserved such a absurdly high valuation. Now, I've seen a few posts on LinkedIn from people talking about hiring con voyagers. And, and what they've mentioned is a lot of them have had really high asks. And mm-hmm. that's been one of the, sort of the, the criticisms about Convoy. It was like, this is a freight brokerage, but it also has this insanely high sort of IT and talent cost because they're trying to bring in this talent. And it's a great thing that Convoy did is they kind of opened this world up to people who are like, yeah, my options are Amazon, Uber, like, and then the Uber freights of the world, the convoys of the world opened up. This is a place that developers and software engineers and that could come to, but at a cost, a very expensive cost. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting point because you, you do want, you know, top talent looking at the trucking industry and trying to figure out what can be changed, what can be solved. And I do think that if you do bring in, perspectives from outside the traditional trucking sphere i think you know anyone who's been to a trucking conference knows that uh or has spent a lot of time in the trucking industry knows that the people who are in trucking tend to be people who like oh my dad was in it my grandpa was in it so on and so forth so if you do get you know different people different perspectives involved it definitely does make the industry a little bit more you know have just have different perspectives and be able to solve certain issues. Now, I think you can like swing the pendulum too far that way where you have like only people who are engineers in, in Seattle or in San Francisco or New York looking at problems and you don't have any of that, like more, I guess, tribal knowledge or more like, uh, you know, knowledge of, of from people who have been in the industry for decades or years or however long. Um, I don't know. I think it's a good it's a good thing to have a mix of like people who can look at trucking with kind of fresh eyes and a mix of people who know the issues and know them well. Um, You know, one thing that I think kind of came out when I was, you know, first starting to report on the trucking industry back in 2018 and, you know, I was reporting on companies like Convoy and Uber Freight. um, I would write things like, oh, they're going to solve empty miles and like no one's ever done this before and i would sometimes receive feedback from readers like yeah it's good that they're looking at this this is not like a new issue everyone's known this has been an issue for for years and it's a really hard issue to solve so trying to figure out you know how do we solve those issues like how do we take serious like big issues in trucking while also not just being like oh yeah if we just apply a few really smart engineers to this we'll solve it in in a few months i think kind of balancing those two perspectives is is important going forward their uh, situation is um unique in how much they raise but a lot of companies raise a lot of money are they the first big domino 
to fall amongst the digital freight brokerages? They're certainly the biggest and probably the most surprising company, I would say, that uh, has collapsed right now. I would say, I mean, as you were discussing earlier in the show, every everyone in the brokerage side is really struggling right now. It makes sense that there would be another digital freight brokerage that also um, you know, has to shut down in the coming months or coming year or so. Or coming weeks. I mean, who knows? This isn't, I mean, yeah. things happen, things happen quick. I had, it's weird this year, um, like Convoy, they were doing their marketing, all their push and everything. I even got like their Hall Star stuff. Hylion Thomas Healy came on here um, on a Friday a couple weeks ago and he was talking up the UX. And then a couple days later in the next week, they can the entire project. So boards are striking and they're doing it where I don't think founders always know what, what's happening. Because I, I don't think Thomas would have done that interview had he known the ERX would just be shelved in a couple days. Yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely a growing hesitancy for investors and and boards and banks to fund certain things. I think people the, these uh you know people are drawing the line in the sand and they're doing it really quickly and I think it's taking a lot of folks by surprise. Well it's tough out there, everybody. I'm seeing a lot of you on LinkedIn. It was kind of the opposite. I remember like for the past two years, you'd see everyone leaving their job. They're switching. They're just jumping companies. Everyone was jumping companies left and right. Even Leatherface over here is leaving the Hewitt house. Um, but now you're just seeing everyone's just like, oh, so you know what? I got I got bit by uh, got bit by the market. Rachel is tough. I know new modes is coming out soon. How do people uh, subscribe? How do they find out more? Yeah, you can just go on freightwaves.com slash modes and subscribe there. Awesome, Rachel. Well, hey, congratulations to you and Alan. Thank you so much. And uh, glad you... Uh, you're married now, Rachel. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me back on after all this time. <laughs> yes, three weeks was a long time. It felt weird. <laughs> it is a while. Okay, take it easy. All right, everybody. Meanwhile, there's a little video from wow. TikToker Thomas Will. Thanks. I Soap hi. too. I'm a small town guy. Oh, hi. I'm big city girl. The truth is, if you don't sell more pumpkins, you may have to shut the whole patch down. Oh, that's terrible. Well, maybe I can help. How so? Well, I used to do marketing in the big city, but my job kept me from ever having a meaningful relationship, so I had to leave. Marketing? I never thought of that. And yeah, ever since I opened up the pumpkin patch, I haven't made time for myself either. Okay, I'll help, but you have to promise not to fall in love with me. A small town guy falling for a big city girl like yourself? <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> That's how uh, Rachel and Alan actually met. No, the freight band online, he said, uh, marketing, I never thought of that. He said, neither is 99% of carriers. All right, it's Alan Adler, Midwest Bureau Chief. I hope she got a little sleep last night. There was a, there was a good uh, baseball game on last night, my friend. You're wearing the hey, shirt from it. Right there, huh? You think that worked you for you? Is, is that like the d oh. practice jersey? What are you wearing there? It's just a it's just a t-shirt, but that's the thing on their shoulders. If you were paying attention, I do pay attention. I think it looks awesome. We've been paying. How you been, by I the way? Have, I think they have uh, next to Oregon, the college. I think the Diamondbacks have the best collection of jerseys of anybody. They've got the one with the the, the sort of the snake skin up here. You know, yeah, really cool. But anyway. You're, you're so yeah, guy. Diamondbacks. They were fun to watch, Dooner. I mean, I had told you that Atlanta was going to win everything. I was obviously wrong about that. So <laughs> now we'll say Texas and six, and go from there. It was rough, man. My kids they they got into baseball this year, and now you know we live out here. I'd love them to be Sox fans, but you know we live out here. The Braves are what's on. They're on the Braves team on Little League. Uh, everyone at school is Braves. They're the Braves fans, but you know then they got to see uh, what happens. What happens? Disappointment when you're a fan. You know why we were Braves fans growing up? Of course, it was it was the Superstation. Sure. We all had to watch You had game. to. It was on because, TBS. And they had, you know, they had, exactly. shot, they had the foam tomahawks and everything. Like it, WGN for the Cubs occasionally, but it was all Braves all the time. Yeah. You know, five uh, minutes after the hour. 7.05. That, that? TBS, that old TBS trick. Remember? Like everything would be on at like 6.05, 7.05. So you yep. couldn't switch yep. to another show because you were tied into some TBS crap. Well, speaking of stuff that we know we need to show, we need a documentary on the rise and fall of Trevor Milton. Because there's even more news. And now Nicola is back in court. They just clawed back $165 million from their founder. What's going on here, Alan? Oh, nice headline. Claws back. Nobody yeah. else said that. I said that. But I like that. I like that. All right. So, so uh, okay. So, Milton hasn't had very many good days lately anyway, Duner. You know that. I mean, he's not 
doing too well. He hasn't called back either. I, I guess I'm sort of losing hope he will. But, but here's the thing. Um, they went to arbitration after <clears> – <throat> okay, so – Trevor gets indicted in 2021, gets convicted in 2022, but the company never got charged criminally with anything, just Trevor. So when the SEC decided it was going to fine Nicola $125 million, Nicola said, wait a minute, we shouldn't have to pay that. Trevor should pay that. So they took him to arbitration. That got put on hold during his criminal proceedings. But ultimately, the arbitration had a lot of the same witnesses that the prosecutors called in his criminal trial. Ergo, you get this $165 million verdict, which would, of course, cover the entirety of the SEC fine, maybe some of the legal bills. But Nicholas says it's not done yet. They want to go after Trevor for some more because they put tens of millions of dollars into defending him as part of, you know, when he was the executive chairman and ultimately, you know, before that, the founder and CEO. So, uh, you know, I think not only the parting, but I think this idea of getting some money back and especially with Steve Gursky, the SPAC sponsor now as the CEO I mean, this is way too good for even Netflix, Dooner. It's just, it's it's almost a fiction, isn't it? How much money was he able to take from this company? When he was there, they hadn't even sold a truck yet. He was busy trying to put like a water fountain in, in, the, in the fictitious Badger. Right, right. Well, yeah, the Badger isn't worth our time now since it never came to pass. However, he took out uh, hundreds of millions of dollars out of the company, uh, $131 million in, a, in one, one swoop back shortly after his lockup expired in December of 21, and then he continued to sell. And there was this brief blip where he bought a few, and it was like, what are you doing here? You're buying shares? Well, he did that because he had gotten some shares back in a land deal or something, and so uh, that was how, it, how, how that worked out. But, but basically, uh, Trevor gets sentenced next month on three federal fraud charges. Uh, we'll see how heavy a sentence it is, but... Um, uh, things aren't going that well for him. And he's got, you know, $100 million in bond out there, which is secured by his $32 million ranch in Utah. So, yeah, I haven't heard much from Trevor myself. Yeah. God, what about Nikola themselves? Are they good? They're trying to get that fuel cell truck out on the road. They had the battery issues. Where are they sitting right now? Do they look good, they look good to you? Well, the, the, yeah, the fuel cell truck's in production, okay? Uh, deliveries supposedly this quarter. Uh, not going to really have any impact on third quarter uh, numbers that we'll see next week. Um, however, the, the bad news, the most recent bad news for Nikola has been that it looks like it's going to be all battery uh, pack replacements for this recall. That's hugely expensive. Typically, a, a supplier would bear some of that cost. Well, in this case, Nikola owned the supplier. So guess what? They've got the whole thing. They, they're carrying the whole bag on this. And the, the intent of getting more shares in the company created, uh, which happened in August, was not to pay for a recall, but was to scale the fuel cell business. Um, now they've got to use some of that money to ultimately pay for this recall. And the big question, and, and you know, we hope to hear next, next week, is where are they going to get batteries? Because Romeo Power, which they bought because Romeo was you know, kind of on the, on the death spiral, they bought them to protect their supply. Then they found out, oh, well, wait a minute, they were discounting what they were selling us, so we have to eat that. And then they find they've got, uh, you know, manufacturing problems and, and ultimately, you know, uh, a sub supplier to them was responsible for this recall. So uh, basically, Nicholas kind of holding the whole bag on this thing, and it's not a, a, a pretty sight. I uh, don't know exactly how much it's going to cost them, but it's going to be expensive. Like by comparison, Dune, you've got Volvo, which did a similar recall for battery issues, but they can lay up, off that cost on Akasol, which is their supplier. Uh, Nikola can't do that because uh, Romeo is us, right? I mean, and they've now liquidated Romeo, so it's not it's not a good situation. It's probably the worst case scenario for the for the recall that they could have envisioned. You've also got, I think, down the road some commerce issues around the idea that truck truck buyers. Who, who took these, you know, 200 or so of the trucks, um, basically can say, wait a minute, I'm not getting any value out of what I bought. You told me to ship this truck back to Arizona, and I did that. And Nicola, by the way, has paid for that too. Uh, but I don't have anything, you know, I don't have this thing in my fleet. Like one guy, um, Salim Yusaveda, who is the CEO and founder at Watt EV, told me last week when we were in Austin, he said, you know, he said, I've got four Freightliners now, Freightliner Ecastadias, that I was able to get from Velocity, uh, be, because uh, I can't get my Volvos, you know, they owe me 80 trucks and, you know, the recall is tying that up and I had to give back my 14 Nicholas because I couldn't take the chance that they were safe. You know, so so here's the startup out there, you know, kind of scrambling to get trucks, just like Nicola is going to scramble to get batteries.
Interesting. You know, ever since, let's talk about another company we followed a lot here. It's the journey of Hylion. A couple weeks ago, Thomas Healy comes on. A few days later, he announces what's happened, that they're not really moving forward with the RX for now. Um, it's been shelved. And ever since, all the Hylion followers, they've been going at, they've been yelling at him. And I get all the mentions. They have been going crazy about this. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm like, why did he even come on if they were just going to shelve this? But I would have to imagine he probably didn't know because it was just a couple days later. Oh, he knew. He knew. Dude, you know, I talked to him last week when I was. Why did he come on then? He didn't have a good answer for that. Uh, he just sort of smiled when, when I asked the question. Uh, but I think I think he knew because the board has been after him for several months now. You were talking to Rachel about you know board activities and so forth. The board has been after him for call it three months to say, look, where is your plan of sufficiency? to make money on the ERX, right? I mean, the, the truck was delayed a year, uh, almost out of the gate. And then of course, you know, we go through all these supply issues. And if you're small and you're only making a handful of systems, you know, uh, you're gonna pay big dollars for stuff. You're gonna be way back in the line in terms of getting supply. So they've gone through that. They've had to raise the price of the ERX system. Remember, this is not a truck. It is a powertrain system. It's natural gas feeding a generator, which makes electricity. Great idea, a little complex maybe, but a great idea. And so, you know, for all of the all of the hype around the company, and there was considerable, remember this was a $55, $60 stock at one time, and now it's, you know, down there with the dollar dollar club. Um, I think, you know, what you're what you're looking at now is there is perhaps an escape hatch. And I wrote about this in uh, in Truck Tech last Friday after talking to Thomas, and that is this. Uh, uh, Carno generator they bought from General Electric Aviation, okay? Um, paid $37 million in cash and stock to get this technology. It's kind of a flux capacitor type thing where you can use any of 20 different fuels to, in the generator. And Highland originally thought this would be a great, uh, you know, follow-on product to the ERX, to the truck. But now they're thinking, hey, you know what? Maybe we do stationary generators instead and make electricity for people, you know, data centers is always the popular answer. But now that you've got all these um, all these depots developing for electric charging, you know, maybe you throw them out there too. So, you know, they can do this by the fourth quarter of next year, and we'll see if that ends up being the alternative play. Uh, I don't think the ERX is shelved, but I do not know how it goes forward because the engine uh, that they were going to use, the natural gas engine from Cummins, will only be around a little while longer. It's not approved for next year after next year in California. So they've got to switch to a bigger engine, a lot more costs. This is already with this system, a $400,000 truck. And, you know, there's not a lot of appetite for that. I don't have much time. So this is kind of a lightning question. Proterra, are these battery manufacturers in trouble? Proterra shut down. Um, they, well, they, did they shut down they, their battery side? No, they had a lot no, of problems they, recently. They, yeah, we, we'd be careful here. They're, they're in reorganization, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and they are, they have pushed out the dates for people to, you know, basically make their offers for their different businesses, but they are still producing batteries uh, right in that building. I was in there in, in June and uh, they are, uh, they, they have a very fascinating, really, you know, production system there. They've, they've doubled it. So they are building or making battery packs in there uh, and staying, you know, keeping on running, but uh, you know, stock is delisted. It's over on the, over the counter now. Um, you know, it's not a good situation financially for anybody who was invested in them. Uh, but, you know, they, it does look like they've got interest in all three of their businesses, which is transit buses, batteries and, and uh, you know, chargers. So, you know, we'll see what happens in, in November. Wasn't it like Minnesota or one of these states or cities said like the buses weren't, weren't great. They kicked them out. They said there's a lot of issues. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about the bus. I don't really follow the bus business very much because, you know, we're not into the buses thing. I end up writing about buses more than I ever thought yeah. I would. Craig might have a bus magazine pretty soon. You've seen some of his acquisitions. I, I haven't seen. Did he buy buses? If he buys, no, buses, no, he I, bought. A, he bought like a sailing mag. He's got like a sailing magazine now, a pontoon magazine or something like that. Um, a couple boating it's magazines, flying lifestyle. Yeah, so maybe maybe bus Man, buying hat on your show the other day. It's like I've got my diamond back on your show today, right? I, I got do. my snake. Well, yeah, Alan, like thank thank you so much for joining me. How do people find more from you? Uh, just like Rachel, you can go to FreightWaves.com, uh, uh, look for Truck Tech, uh, backslash Truck Tech, and you can subscribe there. You can also watch our show this afternoon, every Wednesday, 3 o'clock Eastern. This afternoon, we've had Nikki Okuk from uh, CalStart talking about how small fleets can get money from California to buy electric trucks. Very, very cool. Well, go check it out. Go follow Alan Adler. Thank you, sir.
Thank you. Take it easy. He's got his D-back shirt on, but they didn't even support them. He picked uh, he, he picked the other team. Interesting. Interesting choice, Alan. Did you know that AIT Worldwide Logistics has been recognized as a top performer by Cranes, Forbes, Inbound Logistics, Transport Topics, and yes, even Freight Waves? They are on our Freight Tech 100 list, where we'll reveal the winners at F3. Boost your job satisfaction, regain a sense of purpose, and open your career, oppor- career opportunities with one of the fastest growing organizations in the industry. Visit the career section at AITWorldwide.com to learn more and apply today. They got a spot for you, maybe. Elsewhere... Which fruit brokerage do you think this one is taking place at? Have sprints replaced the gongs? I've asked the freight community. (laughs) Vanessa Vanessa Wayne says, what is so funny about this is that last week a friend of mine came across a video on Instagram and sent it to me. This reminds me of videos you post from your job. She was not wrong, LOL. Monica Thornton says, I'm sure I'll catch flack as being a Debbie Downer, but this would annoy the hell out of me if I was at work. People running by... I mean, maybe it was every day if it was like the Olympics or like a triathlon at the office. But I think once in a while, you know, maybe. Although when I was a little younger that I've broken my ankle like since I was in my 20s and like sprints like that. I just like tear my ACL looking at them. Zach says we need everyone to return to office so we don't lose culture. The culture. Jim Henn says I see the problem. He wasn't wearing sprinter vans. <laughs> Joshua Bree says, that's a decent 40 time, not going to lie. Craig Klein, you aren't a real brokerage if this hasn't happened. Come back from vacation. He said he came back from vacation the other day, and there was a section of the wall that had tons of sticky notes with folks' name on them. Jumping contest on who could jump the highest. So you put the sticky notes. Leatherface, calm down. Hold on a second. Thank you. This chainsaw is driving me insane. I love him, though. Thank you, Armstrong Transport. Um, but, yeah, they're doing jumping contests. You put the sticky note. You hit it up here. Chris Field says, if you didn't do the worm to get the wall touch, he's not mod- <laughs> motivated enough. Bridget says, ooch, the carpet burn at the end. And uh, Andy Barrett says, Dooner, how will I accomplish anything productive today if you keep posting these? Oh, and Connor Miller, somebody give the kid another Adderall. All right, Andrew Hunt, Senior Vice President of Sales Strategic Accounts over at Reliance Partners. And this is probably one of my most requested topics recently, Andrew. Everyone is talking about these escalating insurance costs that carriers are facing, and it seems to be causing a lot of anxiety within the industry. Sure, yeah. I mean, a lot of our clients are definitely voicing the same concerns. Um, you know, I, with, with all the rise of costs and equipment, the medical expenses are going through the roof, litigation abuse, um, insurance companies are being forced to increase those prices. There's still some, there's still some relief out there for those carriers that focus a lot on safety. Um, but I think we'll circle back to that in a second. Yeah, what kind of, well, let's talk about the impact first. So how is this impacting carriers, these escalating things? What is the issue here? I mean, the real issue is that, I mean, from, from what I see, especially in a small to mid-sized fleet space, a lot of these carriers went with the boom in 21 and 22. And so they started doing some things that maybe just weren't safe. They were running over hours. They were hiring drivers, drivers with less, less experience. And insurance companies view that as a risk. And not to nerd out here on insurance, but, I mean, that's all you're doing is you're transferring the risk. So these carriers um, who are seeing this rise in prices for their insurance, it's because they're more risky. Um, not to mention everything's more expensive, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So like, how do we start getting control of this? Is, is now a time, for example, we start reviewing our policies is now a time that you got to think about jumping to another carrier. And when you're thinking about that, what do you have to consider? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that your agent should be shopping your insurance every year. And, and you know, something that we try to do with our clients at RP is we try to, to, to show the marketplace we're blessed to have so much of the marketplace at our disposal. We can go in and we can shop the whole marketplace and show you, hey, these are where these markets are at. Here's why they're declining, declining you as a risk. Here's why they're giving you an increase or here's why they're giving you a decrease. I think having that relationship with your agent is very important to be able to, to build your company to fit not only what you need logistically, but also for one of the top three expenses for a trucking company, which is insurance. So how should, like, if I'm a fleet right now, I'm a carrier, how should I yeah. be thinking? Now, it's great to go to, like, Reliance Partners or, or any ins- to insurance company to get, get quotes, get that stuff. But I have to also, I have to run my house a certain way. So I'm a desirable person to underwrite. I'm a desirable company to underwrite. What do I need to do to be attractive in this environment? I think what I would say is, it, not to sound like a broken record, but the FMCSA puts out these guidelines, right? And they've got basic alerts or CSA scores. If you've got a good trend of CSA scores, um, understanding what your loss frequency is and your loss ratio, 
and giving the insurance company what they want to see. They want, they want to see experienced drivers. They want to see tenure for those drivers. And it's especially hard. I mean, what, we had half a million drivers come out um, off the road and from May of 22 to June of 23, that's a lot of drivers. And so it's really hard for trucking companies to instill those practices with so much turnover, with, you know, chasing the next dollar in the rate. Um, it's really challenging, but trying to stick to the basics with your safety platform, making sure that you're, you're utilizing everything at your disposal with ELDs, cameras, technology, insurance companies are loving that. There's so many new insurance companies coming on the market that are, that are moving towards this techno, technology platform and moving a little bit away from the old school actuarial underwriting. Is it, is it really looked down upon right now to not have at least a dash cam? I'm not even talking about the driver face. I'm talking about to just have a dash cam. I'm not going to say it's looked down upon. Um, I think that the data is there to show that it helps in litigation, uh, which is, uh, I think, one of the, the top 10 reasons for a rising insurance cost is litigation abuse. If you can prove that you weren't neg- negligent, your driver wasn't negligent, for someone who you know who who hired an attorney off of a billboard and made those claims, I mean that's that's more power in your pocket. That will reduce your claims better than anything. And if you can reduce your claims, then your loss ratios are better. If your loss ratios are better, then insurance companies want to insure you. Now there's so many trucking companies, and we talked about at the top of the show all these authorities, all these different um, single trucks and mid-sized trucks and small fleets that came into the yeah. market. I suspect that a lot of them are not that educated on how to manage their insurance, how to go about this. Do you guys offer education? How should the sort of noobs that are listening to this and are like, I'm not even thinking about this. How do they approach it? I mean, to be honest with you, Dinner, I feel like the majority of my job is educating carriers yeah. on what insurance companies want to see. Yeah, my buddy Joe, he's like, all right, Han, because everybody calls me Han. Han, don't get nerdy with them. You know, they don't understand. Don't get nerdy. Don't start talking about risk. But, but we have to. As agents, it's our role to educate um, these trucking companies. It's our role to help them find and procure better insurance at a better price, better coverages. And so much of that's just education because the world of insurance is, is wild. It is. Hey, you ever um, you ever challenged Chad to a sprint through the Reliance offices like that guy was doing in the clip beforehand? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, was, I was laughing at that. I've never challenged Chad to that, and I won't because he's a pretty avid runner. But um, we do have two guys here that that have, <laughs> have had a sprinting contest in the parking lot. <laughs> Anybody who's shocked by that? It's like you haven't. You must not have worked in office with at least like ten guys. Right. I mean, I'm not shocked about it at all. I, I was trying to trying to think. Did he just not make enough calls that day? Was he just the lowest on the sales board? I mean, what was it, you know? It's a tough market. I mean, maybe he had to do he had a sprint to hit the gong because he wasn't doing sales and he didn't know about freightgong.com yet, so he couldn't just uh, <laughs> give himself a freebie. <laughs> so, uh, Han, how do, how do people reach out? How do they learn more about this? Because, again, I, like, like I said, a lot of people have been asking. They need more education. They want to talk to an expert. Yeah, ReliancePartners.com. I mean, that is the easiest way to reach out to someone at Reliance Partners. Uh, our toll-free number's there. Um, asking for a quote, just hit get a quote. I mean, you'll get to talk to an agent, uh, and and that agent should be helping you with, um, with with education. I mean, that's what we're here for. We've got a lot of options too. Uh, once you come on board with our safety team, you know, John Seidel, I think he's been on here before. Brian Reynolds. Um, we just got a, a breadth of knowledge at Reliance Partners to help you run your company in a way that's favorable for for insurance. Well. Han, thank you very much. I'm gonna ring the uh, the I'm gonna ring the little gong for you here. You did an amazing job, <laughs> Thanks, sir. Sooner. Thank you so much. I'll Thanks. see. Uh, all right, hey, are you gonna be at F3? Or, or I know some of the Reliance team will be there. Yeah, I think I'm gonna be there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Then I'll see you a couple weeks in, in person, right down the street. Cool. Thanks. Sooner. All right, man. Take it easy. Okay, some people some people hate this. You know, I'm a, I'm tall, so when I'm on the airplane, um, I if I have like an aisle seat, I, I like to stand up when the plane lands. Some people hate it. They're like, why is everyone standing up? It's like I'm stretching my legs. Well, all of those if you hate those people, me and all of them, we got pushed to the back. I wasn't on this plane, but they, we all got pushed to the back of this plane when uh, this jet blue went up to the jetway here. Apparently, got loaded with too much luggage in the back. Then when everyone got out of their seats, it shifted the weight. I don't think I've ever seen this happen before, and it just dumped everybody back, and I think it crushed someone's Bronco from, from looking closely over there. 
says uh, this happened at uh, JFK Airport. It was on Sunday night. Yeah, JetBlue says the plane tipped backwards because of a weight shift. No injuries reported. Fortunate for that. I wonder if the guy who's not even real was there. Like that lady. Can we combine all our airplane memes together? And then the guy who quit like 10 years ago. Remember that dude who quit by putting the, uh, the, the ramp out, the inflatable ramp, and he was like, I'm out. And he went, and he was like a celebrity for like a couple days on the internet. Justin's laughing. He might remember. Let's bring on Super Trucker. Do it for yeah, me. I remember that guy. What a legend. He was a legend. He had one of like the greatest <laughs> quit like quit things and it became a big online topic. Everyone would be like, how would you quit? What like what would be your like your flavorful way of quitting? And he had like uh, he had a personality. Yeah, most you know, and, and most truck drivers when they want to quit like in a protest, they just abandon the truck somewhere and now they've got a <laughs> mark on their permanent record. I'm sure that guy has something very similar because now anytime potential employer like searches his name that video is going to be the first thing that pops up but you know yeah he needs he need, like a youtube channel thing. where is he i gotta look yeah, him up yeah, there's yeah. someone's probably done a youtube on like what happened to like the jet blue slide guy that's that's a great idea for a youtube channel is like the best way to quit jobs you just find random jobs and just go out with like as, as an incredible exit as you can oh like really a, like a prank channels but instead of like like the prank yeah. is you go to the job and you quit in like a humorous way yeah, yeah. very yeah, interesting you just, you know, <laughs> Just throw a Starbucks coffee everywhere on the way out the door. Well, a bad way to lose your job is to park your truck and have two million dimes stolen out of it by a ring of thieves who put them in coin machines throughout the city. I remember we covered this story. This happened, uh, when did this, for April 13th. This happened April 13th. I remember April, in the spring, yeah. you and I talked about this, and we were trying to figure out what happened, who is involved. And now there's a little bit more details into this case. What happened here, Super Trucker? So this... this um contractor for the u.s mint picked up a load that was bound for miami and he decided it was a good idea to park the truck north of the u.s mint in uh, northeast philadelphia and then go home for the night and he just left a truck full of millions of dollars in dimes just parked overnight and you know surprise surprise a bunch of guys showed up overnight and uh, ransacked it how like how did they how did they know for example was this an inside job why was he parking the wrong way and i know you also looked into this carrier and found out some interesting things about them yeah, they don't have a great safety record. Um, I think it was 27% of their trucks that, that had gotten inspected in the last uh, 24 months had been put out of service, so not not great. They also have one, fat, one fatality um, on their record, too, from the last 24 months. Um, but it looked like it was just part of a string of robberies. Um, you know, a lot of trucks have been uh, getting hit in that area um, recently, uh, everything from frozen crab legs, uh, you know, meat, beer, and liquor. Uh, I, I think this was just like a you know, wrong, wrong place, wrong time kind of situation. These guys were just cracking every, every door open they could find and they hit the jackpot. These guys, it was four. Do you know them for these are four Philadelphia men. You ever run into them at like an Eagles game? 25 year old Raheem Savage, not related to the macho man. 31 year old Ronald, Ronald Bird, 30 year old Hanif Palmer and 32 year old Malik Palmer. Oh, a brother conspiracy team. Mm. They're facing conspiracy, robbery, theft of government money and other charges. And I think the most interesting part of the story was they literally went around to coin stars throughout the city and they were trying to take two hundred and thirty four thousand five hundred dollars in dimes in convert them via coin stars and they only converted up to five thousand dollars before they got caught do you know how uh, long it return. takes have you gone there you go there <laughs> and like when you put in you have to keep moving the sifter back and forth two things get stuck it keeps returning dimes they must have been going insane yeah and then you lose a chunk of it unless you put it on like a applebee's gift card or something so <laughs> i know we have to all take it in like the grocery stores like money so now you have like well with inflation of groceries maybe two hundred thirty four thousand dollars to Publix wouldn't be so bad yeah, well, it would be Acme, but I wonder, do the, do the stores, you know, the coin star machine, do they have to return those dimes if it, if it was uh, ill-gotten? I would think so, right? Yeah, man, what a pain. On the yeah. other hand, well, at least Dime. it's like digital and they have a transaction so that we'd know exactly like how many dimes would ha happened on each one of these uh, occasions. Yeah, and I don't know about most people, but I only, I, I'd like to keep my quarters, so everything else I just kind of dump in, but then they got to like sort and sift through all those coins that were collected uh during that time. So I don't know how they differentiate, like what were the good coins, what were the stolen coins. They probably just like cut their loss and let the insurance companies pay for it. Yeah, unless I'm traveling, I never have cash on me. Like if I get even like yeah. a dime, I give it to my wife. She's like the cash holder. I just use like the card. I don't want it. I lose it. It, it stays in like my pants pockets, gets washed. I, it just like, I don't need it. Yeah, and a lot of places in Philadelphia are still, even in 2023, they're cash only. Ooh.
Ooh. Well, I hope these guys aren't coming to F3. There was, this wasn't the only heist. People are striking trucks, yeah. but they're also striking trains. Look at this hooch heist that happened in Tennessee. Local 3 News says drunk or jacked up. Two Tennessee men are facing a long list of charges after police say the duo burglarized 10 train cars and stole 30 cases of vodka. Several cases of Red Bull had also been tampered with. That's according to the r- arrest reports. These guys, too, a couple young men. Jason Porter is 23, and Ashton Bellantine. They both fa- face a slew of charges. I think they're federal charges. You can't just break into CXX yeah. trains. Yeah, and Bellantine was only 19, so he was also charged with illegal possession of alcohol. Oh, uh, yeah. What, what a wild train, too, having vodka and Red Bull all in the same rail car. I know, like, what, what are the, that's such, like, fortune, you never know, like, if you're a thief, you probably never know what you're going to break yeah. into, you're like, oh, my God, look at all these dimes I got, or, like, I don't know, it's like getting a mystery box, or, like, a blind bag. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, uh, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. They said, uh, yeah, the police, uh, the police said they stole it for the sorry, purpose of drinking, I would, I would say, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, so a lot of these uh, thefts, you know, they're, they're part of, like, larger theft rings, but then you got you know, just some random yahoos breaking into stuff, too. You never really know who you're dealing with uh, with these thefts. There was that. that we, we reported on that uh, crab leg theft, like, two weeks ago, and everyone was mm-hmm. accusing Jameis Winston on my LinkedIn. I uh, don't know who that guy is. He's a, for, he's a football player who, when he was in college, oh. he stole a bunch of crab legs. <laughs> Allegedly, I think. I don't know. Maybe I bought uh. <laughs> It was, oh, tra- uh, Fraser Good Game says, I don't want to get sued by Jameis Winston. I'm, I'm sticking with allegedly, but Google it. Jameis Winston and the Crab Legs. <laughs> yeah, CYA. Hey, so Kevin Rutherford, we found out he's coming down to F3 and he's out in his RV. However, this ended up causing some controversy because he took a photograph and he posted mm-hmm. on Twitter and he's like, hey, he's just doing a guessing game with people. He says, last stop before Nashville, where am I this morning? And he thinks people are just going to look at the beautiful pictures. But he doesn't realize there's a bunch of old bitter SOB truckers on there who are like, wait a second, why? And you're one of them. You're like, why is your FRV in a truck parking spot? First of all, why do truckers hate when RVs go in truck parking? spots oh well just you know truck stops are there for trucks um and a lot of times you know you'll, you'll see an rv so in that in that photo the passenger side is is pushed out but rvs you know especially nice ones like kevin's got they, they can go on both sides so yeah sometimes you'll, you'll show up to a spot and it's crowded and the only available spots are somewhere where an rv park and they're pushed out to both sides now he's taken up two maybe even three spots so that's basically the attitude of why truck drivers hate that kind of stuff I want to think that when Kevin was like posting this, he did so with a twinkle in his eye because there was a lot of engagement in the comments of like, how dare you, sir? And he's like, what do you mean? I just, you know, I, I got to park where I, where I can. Well, he has, he had a good attitude about it too. He didn't like fight against it. He like let it, he's like, no. Oh, okay. never mind. This is getting traction. I'm going to lean into it. But he did get comments. Enil Garmik Mulker says, you don't, you, you just don't respect drivers. There's only one spot for 11 truckers. You probably park there just to bang your gong and celebrate broker appreciation month. <laughs> yeah. No, Neil, Neil's got a good sense of humor about this. Uh, David was like, you should be at a campground and not taking up trucks, parking spots, but alas, you're not. Should he, should he, he be in the camp? He, I mean, he may have bought fuel. I mean, look, truck drivers, th- you, uh, look, truckers, I got to tell you something. You're not the only people who use truck stops. I mean, there's a lot of people on vacation, commuting to work, driving through there. I mean, yes, truck drivers take up a big portion of it, but they're, you know, it's not just for truck drivers. And I think he took David's advice today because uh, the, the, the photo he posted this morning was him at a nice campground site. Ooh, intro- oh, I, well, he's learning. Yeah. Clifford said, in his opinion, it depends on the truck stop. And I, this is what Kevin was saying. He was like, look, there was adequate room for the truck. I didn't park overnight. I parked there and took the photo and did my business at the truck stop and left. Mm-hmm. I wasn't taking a spot from everyone. And that's basically what this guy's like. Well, I mean, if, it, if you're not stealing people's spots, but like Truck Confidential, come on, man. Why do you take truck parking spots that are dedicated for truck parking? You usually park in front of the truck stop. But Justin Wood says, I hope this is sarcasm. If not, he buys fuel just like the trucks do. And there's nothing declaring that parking is only for trucks, which is also true. Yeah, some of the larger truck stops will have like bobtail and RV parking at the front of the truck stop and then, you know, spaces in the back for trucks. This is a pretty small truck stop. Um, people immediately knew exactly where he was. But, you know, you get enough truck drivers online, they're going to see places that they've been before and they recognize him. And I, I was looking at it on Google Earth and yeah, it's a, it's a pretty small spot. But from that photo, it looked like there were still plenty of spots available. So Kevin Safe, he explained it. He's got a CDL. He knows how to drive a truck. He had his RV there. He's not yeah. stealing anybody's spot. But in general, how do you feel about RVs, like the ones who park overnight and think they are semi-trucks? 
I would say you got to read the room. You know, if it looks like it's a really full place, maybe park up front. Just be courteous. You know, think think about how you would feel if you go to your RV park and there's nothing but semis parked everywhere. Dude, I got to tell you, why are RVs like a lot? We have so many regulations about like emissions and everything. And I've looked at RVs yeah. and they get like three miles per gallon. Uh, a semi truck, at least you can excuse like eight to 12 miles a gallon because they pull commerce. They keep ourselves stocked. It's a, you know, it's a necessary evil, whatever it is. But if you're like all in on the sustainability thing, why are like our RVs not under fire? Yeah, well, I, I guess when you're at that kind of income level to be able to afford an RV, you've got the people in your corner to lobby the government to kind of carve out those exemptions for you. Um, but also like it, they're an easy target, you know, everybody wants to dunk on people that have RVs, but also kind of secretly hope that they achieve that level of income to maybe afford one one day. I would love to have an RV. I would love to take my son across the country to all the cool places that I've been to. Yeah. What is going on here? So like I, he sells, like, do we need to start putting want the truck episodes on CD or vinyl? Because he sells like his training courses on like an eight (laughs) CD set. How much money is this guy making selling CDs? I don't know. And also, where, what are you listening to these things on? Do cars even do they even sell cars with the CD players anymore? I don't know. What he's selling them? He's got them out there, and he's making. Apparently, he's making good money doing it. The music industry should talk to him. Uh, Justin, yeah, you yeah. you you've probably I like I've had plenty of jobs, not even trucking. Like I've had uh, like McDonald's. You have a tra- safety training video. Almost every place I've worked, you have mm-hmm. some kind of safety training video. Well, I have a very unique one to, to show you here. It's actually from What the Fork, and I hope they were inspired by their name. They do follow us on TikTok. Let's take a look at their safety training video. Remember, you should never ever leave a truck parked in neutral. A forklift driver could unexpectedly fall out the back, and unfortunately, forklifts <laughs> tend to roll. Disclaimer, it gets Remember a little gory. That forklifts are forklifts, <laughs> not some kind of Tokyo Drift. Tokyo Drift. That's the best Fast and the Furious movie. In my <laughs> yeah, my favorite. Forrest Gump. <laughs> oh no, five. Uh, Five's the good I'll one. never forget the time I let my guard down in the break room. My I think that guy follows us on Twitter. Certified. He decided <laughs> to take the forklift to make a couple of TikToks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right through my heart. Oh, that's uh, he's that already got hit. Me. I knew I was done. That crazy white boy was always hitting the blinker on the job. I knew one day he'd blow up the place. Never take a coworker's absolute disregard of safety precaution as some sort of joke, whether it be on purpose or some sort of accident. It could be the end of all of us. <laughs> the narrations are the best part. Yeah, it sounds like Morgan Freeman on Delta 8. So remember, ask yourself every time you clock into work, are you prepared to die? <laughs> Did you ever have to watch a safety video like that one? Oh, all the time. Even, even not just with my job. So one of my mom's last jobs she had before she retired was like the safety coordinator at, at her job. And so she had to compile like just the most horrific videos you've ever seen. Like, like imagine live leak on steroids. And she was just like, I've watched 50 people die today on these videos and I have to like show them all to people at work. So this, this video was obviously like a parody of, you know, this was, this was a real safety video, but the guy dubbed it over in like a red letter media Mr. Plinkett voice. Um, but the videos that she saw, she would like forward me a couple and I'm like, oh my God, this is just the most horrific. A lot of it was like overseas stuff too. Wait, so I, I get the overdubbing, but like the shots are so like B-movie-esque, like the gore and stuff. This that The whole thing yeah. wasn't just a joke? No, so so that, that that video in particular was like safety videos that whatever company this was like oh. produced for themselves. These are re, these are reenactments of like actual actual instances. But the the ones that, that were like real, um, a lot of them are like Chinese manufacturing. Um, what's like the worst ones? Like like rolls of paper. Yeah, you will like, you'll never catch me a mile near a factory that deals with any kind of like big rollers because what happens is like somebody walks by one, they stick their finger in something, and they just get you know chewed up. And yeah. Spread out. No, we, we play the uh, computer animated deaths on here quite frequently to, to spare you the, the gore. But I, I assure yeah. you, I've actually seen the real versions of those on uh, old Reddit, Reddit subreddits that have since been um, canceled. We, I was watching my poor wife. We were watching the Phillies game last night and I got my laptop on it. And I'm like just on the couch, just crying, <laughs> laughing at this while the Phillies, the Phillies are losing the series. And <sighs> <you know. laughs> It's tough to watch the bats go dead. I had to watch that happen to the Braves. Like it felt kind of like watching a reverse of the Braves Phillies where like the, they just couldn't get anything going. Yeah, no, it's, it's all up to the Eagles now. They're the only thing that can save uh, Philadelphia sports this year.
You know who's building up momentum? It's the UAW. Check out this yeah. chart here. Disruptor stocks. He says UAW strike intensifies. GM now striking at Arlington, Texas. This was yesterday. It was a surprise strike. It's 5,000 workers producing full-size SUVs. SUVs are the top-selling cars. It's their, it's their most profitable plant. Now the top three prof- profitable plants at all three are on strike. Now there's 45,425 combined on strike at the big three. Supply chain snarls as truckers have seen increased wait times. You can shoot. You can see that shoot right up on there. Yeah. And all the while this is going on, Justin, do you know that a car loan, a new car loan is now over 9.5%? <laughs> yeah, I, we bought our two cars a couple of years back and like we timed, we timed this perfectly. Um, two Subarus, knock on wood, nothing happens. But yeah, I, I, gotta, I feel bad for anyone in the market right now trying to buy a car. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I think this would, if we were in different times, this would shock the big three a lot more than it is mm-hmm. now. We, this whole story we've been saying, ever since I talked to Larry, I had Larry Long on here, he said, hey, look at these inventory levels. And I'm telling you, this is going to be a prolonged strike because the UA, because the big three, they need to burn through some inventory anyway. They've wasted a lot of money on these EVs. They need some, they need some reasons and excuses to do some things in this market. So they're not in a rush. But I wonder when it's yeah, going it's- to be too much. At some point, there's got to be a tipping point here. Yeah, it's a bit of a cat and mouse game because, you know, this gives them an excuse to burn through all that excess inventory. They're not paying payroll right now because all the workers are on strike. Um, but then the EUAW is also being very strategic and not just everybody going on strike all at once because then that's going to drain their strike fund. So they're, they're being very, like, incremental with, with how they, um, you know, do these strikes. I don't know who's going to be, like, how many other plants or workforces are there that, that can go on strike after this? <laughs> It's going to be wild. Another another interesting story that developed. There's been so much news. Like it, it I, no. like the summer was after yellow. The summer got a little bit boring, and now it's just like the fall has just been insane. Like Cruise, a company we've covered, we've been covering their journey, their their wins and their struggles. They had that one accident with the truck. They had a couple of pedestrian mm-hmm. incidents. They had that one in Atlanta where they started operating. Remember where all the cruise vehicles? Too many of them got near each other, and it caused some sort of congestion. They didn't know how to unbundle themselves. But now there's been too many incidents in California, and just yesterday. Cruz said, we learned today at 10.30 a.m. Pacific time of the California DMV suspension of our driverless permits. As a result, we'll be pausing operations of driverless AVs in San Francisco. Really weird, because just a month ago, Gavin Newsom overturned that law that was going to force uh, autonomous trucks to have a safety driver. This, this industry is not viable with safety drivers. Their commercialization needs to have that driver out, yeah. because it makes no sense to pay someone who costs more than a driver who is safety trained to sit there with all the tons of equipment. It could be a death blow for crews in California. Yeah, it was really interesting how they, they you know they vetoed the um, the ban on autonomous vehicles, but then the DMV just has the power to just pull the permits anyway. So I wonder if going forward, all these autonomous uh, truck and car companies, where any little thing that that happens, the DMV can just yank their permits. I don't know. I, I, that would have that would be a big risk factor if I was an autonomous vehicle yeah. operator in that state. I would probably consider going someplace that's been a lot more friendly, for example, like Texas, that is allowing autonomous lanes and autonomous corridors to operate. California is obviously tough. And there's only a few places you can do this because, like, there's weather conditions and things that you have to take into yeah. factor. Someone was like, why doesn't Cruz just come to Michigan? They can't test in Michigan. They can't just run every season but, like, winter out there. Yeah, the worst kind of weather in San Francisco gets is, like, maybe a little bit of heavy fog, but that's yeah. it. But, you know, as we've seen in the last couple of winters, you know, Texas winters can be brutal. The, the, the ice and everything that builds up over there, they don't get, like, a lot of heavy snow, like, up in Michigan, but they do get some crazy ice storms. Um, so we don't, we don't even know how those uh, taxis would perform in uh, hey, conditions like that yet. Hey says, quite a disastrous five hours for GM, losing $200 million EBIT per week due to UAW strikes, and UAW extends strikes to most profitable plan. Then crew suspends to operate in California, effective immediately. Yikes. Mm. Speaking of something that maybe should be in a safety video, I'm going to ask you if this is fair or foul. Justin, roll the tape. When your bro-in-law needs an emergency Red Bull. That's a big can. Yeah. For you audio listeners, there's a guy driving around with a can, and he's waiting for another truck to come by so he can pass the baton. The baton, in this case, being a Red Bull. So he's got one hand on his cell phone, one hand with the monster out the, out the window. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that that should get maybe a, a reset. And then the, the video itself is in slow mo, so he's still. And then bam! Did he get it? It looked like it oh, fell. It looks like he got it. I know he got it. it. That reflection looked like it fell, but I think he put it in. 
I just, uh, every time I see videos like that, so I think it was like Moab or one of those like mountain, Rocky Mountain type areas. There was a guy in a Jeep and he was climbing up the hill and he stuck his arm out to try and balance his car. Well, the Jeep just kind of rolled and just snapped his arm. And I think of that every time I see somebody sticking their hand out the, out the window like that. We're going to have to end on that note. Losing your arm, handing off Red Bulls. Justin says foul. I say foul. Don't do it. It's not safe. Find us at FW What the Truck. Find him at Super Trucker. He's search banned. Find me at Timothy Tudor. Take care. Don't be strangers. <laughs>